And I love the fact that Peter Davison, Colin Baker, yeah, Sylvester yeah. McCoy, they're still making audio adventures because, because there are people who love this show and there are even new people coming in to listen to those, those stories. Please stand away from the computers and make yourself known. <laughs> I have to colour this in with my little pen, otherwise I don't know who's speaking. Never... The Big Finish uh, audio CDs, I think, were, were designed to fill the gap ever since um, Doctor Who went off the air. <laughs> There's a huge <laughs> fan base out there and they were desperate for Doctor Who stories. So our first one came out in 99 and we've been bashing away at it ever since. Nicola, yes. I think you might need to go half an inch at most closer to your mic. For God's sake, get your act together, Nicola. Um, nobody told me. <laughs> OK. Should we go for a take? Yeah. Why not? Mm -hmm. And off you go. I imagine that's the purpose of the space station, docking facilities up there that beam down here. Almost certainly. So you're not sure? No, don't go getting all upset. It really won't help. Doctor, we can't keep losing Aramem like this everywhere we go. I... I can't deal with it. I know, Perry, but the best thing we can do is to be positive. Let's go with Butley here and see what happens. I'm sure we'll find Aaron Mem soon enough. The fans who listen to the audios know the show well, they know the characters, and so they're established in their minds. Perry, their imagination that? knows no what bounds. She was just in there, but, but she disappeared. I always felt that Doctor Who really was perfect for the um, audio medium. Because radio only gives you half the story through the words, through the sound effects. Everything else you have to kind of make up for yourself. Colin Baker likes to say, and I heard him, heard him say it many times, the sets are brilliant. I mean, people have said, oh, well, yes, you can't see the wobbly sets and the, and the, the rubber monsters, but I don't think Dr. Nessie had rubber sets and uh, wobbly monsters. That's the wrong way around. But anyway... Part of its cheapness, part of its slight amateurness at times, allowed viewers in. It allowed viewers in to say, no, it should be like this, and that monster should look like this, and... If it looks like this, it could do this. And then your imagination starts. Instead of becoming a critic, you become a writer. It's some kind of transmat device. Am I right, Butler? You are correct, Doctor. It is a transmat. This is the station power plant, but the transmat here is connected to the general colony systems. Beautiful. They're professional writers, but they started off as Doctor Who fans, as, as indeed, you know, we all have. And therefore, it was quite easy to say to them, look, would you like to... You've done books, now come and do an audio script. Um, and that's really how we went initially. That's the one. And what's, you, I suppose, been really quite flattering for us is that now they've all been half-inch by the Doctor Who production team and they're all working for Chris and Billy, and we're thinking, oh, that's our writers you've just stolen. Thank you, Mr Russell T Davis. <laughs>